Hello everyone, I'm Jodie, I'm the specialist bariatric nurse at Salford. Um, so for those of you that have never been before, welcome. This is our support group. It is well attended by Zoom, as you can see, we've got 164 so far joined us tonight. So I really appreciate everyone um, uh, joining in. The idea is uh, during these really difficult times where delays for surgeries, delays for meeting the team, um, mean that you are in our service a lot longer. We want to make sure you have somewhere to touch base every month, that you don't feel lost, you know, that we're all here still. And you're familiarising yourself all the time with um, the bariatric surgery. This might be your very first meeting. Um, so tonight's quite a nice one because we are actually talking about surgeries. Uh, but the idea is that you can make an informed decision across the way if bariatric surgery is for you. Uh, next week, uh, sorry, next month rather, will be the ever popular patient experience night. Um, so you can look forward to that one as well. Um, and if you've been here, maybe you've already met our team and you're just touching base, that's great because all of this knowledge is always useful. So tonight, we have our consultant surgeon, Mr. Grocock. He's been with our team for a while now um, and he's kindly given his time for us this evening. So I'll hand over to Mr. Grocock. Thank you. OK, thank you, Jody. Um, just like to welcome everyone to the meeting. Uh, we're going to go through a short presentation about the surgical options available and uh, then we'll take some uh, time for question and answers at the end. So. The, the most common operation that we offer, uh, that there's two really, the most common is uh, a sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, and across the world, we're seeing roughly twice as many sleeve gastrectomies performed these days uh, as bypasses. And we're gonna go through the two operations in turn. Uh, the advantage of uh, the sleeve gastrectomy really uh, is that uh, it works. It's very uh, straightforward, works well. And what I like about it is I think it's more physiological. So it keeps us a, a uh, intact route straight through the bowel. If we go back to the, uh, the picture there, we can see as we come down the esophagus through the stomach, we're straight into the uh, small bowel and food passes through in the normal way. So in terms of uh, surgical aspects to it, it's easier than a bypass in bigger patients. And it's also uh, easier to do in people that have had previous surgery. Uh, obviously, uh, for people that have uh, had no experience of surgery, once you have any operation, uh, structures within your abdominal cavity, particularly the small bowel, uh, sticks uh, to other surrounding structures. So the more surgery you've had, the more difficult it is to, to do a bypass. And the beauty of a sleeve really is that uh, everything is just concentrated in the upper abdomen. And as long as you haven't had previous gastric surgery, it's straightforward to, to do a nice operation. In terms of disadvantages, the only real disadvantages I would see is uh, it creates a high pressure system. And what I mean by that is, again, if you look at the, the picture of the stomach in the upper right of the screen, uh, you can see that we reduce the size of the stomach. And what that means is the pressure within the residual stomach is higher. Uh, than previously and indeed higher than after a bypass. And that means that some patients get reflux. So one of the questions we'll be talking to you about in depth uh, when you come uh, to the outpatient clinic is whether you've ever had reflux and whether you've got hiatus hernia. So we would tend to avoid a sleeve if either of those two things are the case. Now, this is a, a picture of a, a, a bypass. This is the traditional uh, gold standard uh, operation. And you can see that anatomically it's uh, slightly more complicated uh, than a, a sleeve. Again, if we follow the food down from the top, you can see a red arrow there. As the food comes down the gullet, we end up with a, a small pouch of stomach uh, and we bring a, a loop of small bowel onto that small pouch. So it's slightly different to a sleeve. The way a sleeve works is that essentially it's what we would call a restrictive procedure in that you're just able to eat less. And after a bypass, it's both restrictive because you've got a gastric pouch, but it's also malabsorptive in that the food doesn't pass through all of your bowel. Now, again, as we go through the advantages and disadvantages, the relevance of that should become uh, clearer. So in terms of effectiveness, uh, extremely effective a bypass 
it probably it is better than a sleeve if people are diabetic, gives slightly better results uh, and also less reflux. Uh, technically more difficult difficult if you've had previous abdominal surgery. And we do see problems afterwards. We sometimes see ulceration at the anastomoses. Uh, longer term, we can see hernias. And also because the bowel uh, isn't intact in the normal sense, uh, we see uh, a degree of malabsorption, not just of food, but also of vitamins and minerals. So there ought to be uh, much more careful follow-up after a bypass than after a sleeve. So if we were to run the two procedures off against each other, you can see in many ways similar um, from a patient point of view. Uh, the two most important things, I think, are line two and line three, safety and low complications. You can see they're very, very similar. Uh, slight advantage in terms of long term results for weight control from a bypass. And uh, in terms of maintenance, slight advantage to a sleeve for the reasons we've said. And that's because your bowel, you know, isn't intact and it's a malabsorptive procedure for a bypass, whereas a sleeve, uh, your GI tract is intact from top to bottom. Now, the, the final thing to just consider is uh, from a, a surgical point of view, if we were looking to, to do a bypass and it were difficult in a larger patient, sometimes we compromise, sometimes we compromise and uh, perform a sleeve. Uh, but equally, sometimes we perform a, a single anastomosis bypass. Now, from a surgical point of view, as we bring the small bowel up towards the gastric pouch, uh, the, the weight of the, the bowel or the, uh, the blood supply to the small bowel can be very, very heavy in a larger patient. And sometimes the tissues are fragile. And if we're trying to simplify uh, what we're doing at time of surgery, uh, that's when we would compromise to either a sleeve or sometimes a single bypass. Now, single bypass has only really been going for a few years. We haven't got long-term uh, results for it, but increasingly it's, it's starting to look like a, a good option. Um, so, you know, I think it, it would be fair to say that, that the two main operations are going to be offered uh, when you come to the surgical clinic is going to be a sleeve versus a bypass. I've just put this on the screen so that you're aware that uh, it's one of the compromise options which we might end up uh, needing to perform. Uh, if people struggle with it, the main uh, disadvantage as I would see it is that if we go back to the, the image, you can see the food comes down where the red arrows are and we want the food to continue down uh, the, uh, the bowel, as you can see in the image on the right where the red arrows are. Now, the green arrows are all bile. And so you can see there'll be some bile coming around and has got to go back into your gastric pouch. So we see more problems with reflux after a single anastomosis bypass than we do after a rule y gastric bypass. So pros and cons to every operation. Essentially, the um, I think the skill of surgery is to... Uh, sit with you in the preoperative clinic and try and choose the best operation and then uh, obviously on day of surgery to uh, perform the best operation for each particular uh, patient so that everyone gets a nice safe uh, effective and long-lasting operation now that's really all i had to say i'd be very happy just to move on to questions and answers and we can go through the the differences uh, between the two ops now, um, shall I hand back to uh, the chair uh, for taking question and answers from the chat? Yeah, that'd be brilliant. Thank you. Um, do you want to just stop sharing your screen and then everybody can see? Everybody, great. Um, okay, I'm just going to change the view that, so that everybody can see the, the panel. Um, so just bear with me one second. Um, okay, so we've got quite a few questions actually, um, so I'll start at the top and we'll try and work our way through. Um, if anybody in the panel wants to answer these by typing, feel free. Um, so, um, I, have, I have severe sleep apnea, lupus and diabetes. Is bariatric surgery um, a safe option for me? Uh, in terms of safety, I, I would say yes, uh, at least 
in terms of choice of procedure in some ways it'll be guided by your uh, your bmi uh, your, your total weight um, because in very high bma bmi patients sometimes a sleeve is easier but if you're a diabetic uh, often we try and uh, do a bypass if we can no, I was nodding and, nodding and smiling there because when you said, oh, I have type 2 diabetes, I have obstructive sleep apnea, they are two of the main conditions that we see really good um, reversal of after surgery. We never say to people that type 2 diabetes is cured, um, but very often it becomes extremely well managed or goes into full remission, which is wonderful, as, and that can happen very quickly after surgery. Um, so yeah, and, and picking up on Mr. Grocott's point, when we meet you, it is all very individual. So if you're coming from a very high BMI, technically it's not always easy to do a bypass. We may have to consider, um, in some cases, maybe even a two-stage um, procedure where we might look at doing a sleeve because it's technically the easiest to see how you get along with that. And then if there was still a, a clinical issue that um, uh, and further weight loss could be gained with the bypass, um, we sometimes do that as well. So these tend to be in patients with a BMI above 60. Thanks, both of you. Um, so the next question is from Rob. Um, can the bypass only be done if you have a BMI of 60 or below? I kind of answered that a little bit then, didn't I? Yeah, so it can it can technically be. It's, it's quite, there is definitely a difference in the genders with the way that we carry our fat. And um, so gentlemen tend to be a bit more all out front and the, and the obesity can be a lot, lot more kind of in and around their organs. They tend to be a lot more compact. Ladies um, tend to have a, a be a bit more widespread. Um, it tends to be a bit more perhaps of a pear shape. Um, so it, it's very much that the surgeon's not being rude when he meets you, but he's definitely going to make eye contact with you and he's going to look down at your girth, as it were, and think about where can I fit my scopes and how technically easy is this going to be? Um, so they're not being rude. They want to make this as safe as possible. So as I say, for some people, further weight loss um, is, is desirable if they're really after a, a bypass for, for the reason. And so, like I said, some two stage can be offered at, um, in in more in cases where we're coming from a much bigger BMI. Thanks, Jodie. And um, so Sarah has said that she has been told um, that when she has surgery, they will fix her umbilical hernia and gallstones at the same time. Is that accurate? Shall I let you take that one, Mr. Grocott? Yeah, I think. Um... Again, I think it might be more sensible to do things in stages. Uh, and the, the reason why I would say that is uh, in many ways, particularly if you have a bypass, your primary operation is, is difficult enough. Uh, sometimes when you meet somebody in a clinic, they might say things like, I'll oh, just go off to the bariatric service. They'll do your gallstones and sort your hernia out. We'll do a high hernia repair. People try and sometimes tell patients what they think patients want to hear. Um, I think if we were looking to manage risk, particularly in heavier patients, it might be more sensible to do your bariatric procedure, keep things relatively simple at the time of your bariatric operation. And then as your weight comes down, it becomes far safer and far simpler to operate a second time and sort out uh, problems like biliary disease and hernias. Thank you. Um, I think there's there's quite a few questions just um, coming off some of the terminology that was used in one of those answers. And um, so, what is classed as a large pa um, patient? So, I think just to clarify that. So yeah, when you look at BMI, it's silly, isn't it? It'll say like healthy weight, overweight, obese. Ob super obese, super, super, super obese, and so on and so on. So obviously when we meet our patients, um, BMI is quite a useful tool. Um, obviously the, the actual weight itself as well is something we would look at. So patients that have a BMI over 60 are the patients where um, it's going to be a, a higher risk operation. And we will be thinking about the, the safest options for you. Um, and then we would say somebody with a lower BMI who is classed as obese would be um, perhaps 35 to 40. Um, and, then, and, and then obviously everything in between. But as a team, we're very experienced in dealing with people of all shapes and sizes. Um, and we're also really keen that you get to make an informed choice. And our surgeons want to be able to give you the safest options, then we'll give you the benefit of our expertise if there if you come in with an idea that you really really just wanted this surgery we'll tell you what we believe 
And if your surgeon believes it's safe, if you're fully aware of the risks, if there's something else and they technically feel that they're happy to do it, then um, we may look at the option that, that could carry more risk. So when I'm talking about that, it might be somebody who has perhaps mild reflux um, and they've, they've, they've uh, got type 2 diabetes and we might say, well, we, we as a team think this would be brilliant to have a bypass. Um, but then we would discuss that at length if you came in thinking I'd, I'd rather have a sleeve. And um, so we'll go through all those pros and cons that Mr. Grocott put across in his presentation with you and how to make that informed choice in, in clinic too. Thanks, Jodie. Um, so then there's a question about vitamins and supplements. So would you recommend starting to take um, vitamin supplements now as a precaution for potential um, vitamin deficiencies following surgery? Um, not really, no. I, I think um, our body has what it needs and what it doesn't need, it will wee out. So if you don't need it, you'll just wear it out. So it, it's kind of, if you're very concerned about something and you, you should discuss with your GP and they would arrange blood tests to look at things for you. When you come to meet our team, we routinely look at all the micronutrients. And if we feel something's a little bit low and it's quite common for us to have, for example, vitamin D um, because of where we are in the hemisphere, that's the beautiful sunshine drug. We're obviously not getting a lot of that right now. To absorb vitamin D, you need to have good calcium. So that's your dairy products and so on. So sometimes, um, you know, it's, it's the most common one that can be a little bit low would be your vitamin D. Uh, so we'll do a blood test, we'll look at everything when you come to clinic and then we'll write to your GP advising on anything we'd like you to take um, just to boost that so that at the time of surgery you're optimal um, for having the bariatric surgery and then lifelong supplements are needed after surgeries simply because you don't get everything you need from diet alone. Um, so practicing taking tablets never all at once because after surgery if you try to take all your tablets in one go you'd be full and you won't manage any breakfast and um, so it's just getting used to taking tablets spread out throughout the day and um, so that would be a better thing to do so if somebody who takes lots of tablets start practicing having them spread out because that's the only way you'll be able to manage them after surgery. Thanks Jodie and um, this next question is quite a heavy one but I think it probably plays on a lot of people's minds and um, so somebody has said my biggest worry is death how like how likely would it be that, that that's kind of the outcome following bariatric surgery? Before I answer that one, Jody. Um, I think it is fair to say that there is some risk to any operation. Uh, but one of the things that we like about bariatric surgery as surgeons is that the, the risk of death is tiny. So it's about keeping things in perspective. If we were to compare the risk of uh, an ongoing life surgery I would say you're far far safer to have surgery than not to um, so although we do see complications there's a lot of high volume surgery happening uh, abroad uh, these days and as a bariatric center we have to admit and manage patients from that come back from all over the world with complications after bariatric surgery in terms of uh, operations at Salford although we do see complications I would say it's rare and in terms of death I would say that the chance is uh, tiny I've never yet seen a, a death after bariatric surgery performed in the UK so um, you know I, I would keep things in perspective and I would be reassured. Thank you um, so then there's two questions that are quite um, similar here so how effective are gastric balloons in comparison with these surgeries and do you still offer the gastric band? I don't mind answering that. Um, so as a team, <clears throat> at one point, the gastric band was being offered. Um, I think in the time I've been with Salford, and that's a good seven years now, I've seen two gastric bands. Um, one failed completely, and the other lady, um, she, she, did, um, she, she did well with it. I think the point of a gastric band is it's a little belt that sits at the top, top of your stomach. And if you have real problems with portion sizes, it can be quite useful to help with that restriction. It doesn't do any of the metabolic changes that are bariatric surgery. And by metabolic changes, I mean um, in terms of your satiety, your, um, uh, your hunger hormones, and changes that we see that are to do with kind of your metabolism and the way that your uh, uh, 
insulin levels behave after a bariatric surgery. Um, even your hypothalamus, that little sensor in your brain, um, seems to be more satisfied after bariatric surgery. So there's lots of wonderful things about bariatric surgery we don't always fully understand. Um, but with weight loss, we know the great benefits. And you would, normally when people come to see our team, they're there because they are at a point where that weight is not going to shift easily. They diet and exercise is one thing, but when you kind of at a certain point, it's very difficult to, to um, manage uh, really sustainable long-term weight loss. So with a gastric band, uh, again, we are a little bit biased as a, bar as a bariatric service. We do a lot of taking bands out. Um, and that's because there can be problems with bands, they can erode into the stomach, they can slip, so it makes it really hard for you to get any diet down easily, and then you're stuck on ice cream and quavers and foods that, you know, you were trying to avoid that still give you weight gain. Um, so there can be problems with the gastric band long term as well. Um, so it can be an effective weight loss tool if you kind of, especially if you're relatively low BMI, compared to a lot of the patients that are considering um, uh, surgeries. And um, the gastric balloons can be a very useful tool. Um, in the NHS, we might occasionally place a gastric balloon um, if it was, wasn't possible for us to do a safe sleeve gastrectomy in, say, somebody who had a very high BMI. Um, and there's also medical weight management that can help us with weight loss as well, again, for those very, very high BMIs of 70, 80. Um, so in the private world, they tend to boast that a gastric balloon around the four month stage could help somebody lose one to two stone. Um, and that probably is not going to make a big impact on your health and well-being long term. So we don't use it as a primary weight loss tool. So okay. I guess the short answer is we to offer by bypass and sleep. <laughs> Brilliant. And um, that leads us on quite nicely to the next question. Um, can the bypass be reversed when the weight loss goal is achieved? I take that one, Jody. Yeah, it, it can be reversed, but I would say it's difficult. Um, <clears throat> in terms of what we were saying before about bands, uh, we used to use bands as a the entry level bariatric operation, really, uh, and I would say that that band has been replaced by the sleeve. Uh, I think sleeve is far safer and far more effective uh, than, a, than a band. And from a surgical point of view, we get a little bit frustrated with bands in that uh, I've seen one research paper that says 9% of all bands need to be removed each year. So for example, I took two out last week. So we take out far, far more than are currently being put in. They're not particularly effective and they're not particularly durable. And we sometimes see horrible complications from them. Uh, so I would encourage you to steer away from, from bands. Uh, in terms of balloons, uh, we tend to use uh, balloons for very heavy patients just to try and get a bit of weight off so that your primary procedure is as easy and as safe as possible. Uh, they are used in the private sector, in my view, for people that probably don't need bariatric surgery and uh, would probably be sa safer and more effectively treated with, with medication. Uh, so as Jody says, two main operations, really sleeve versus bypass. And in many ways, the results are very similar. Um, some slight advantage to, to bypass, uh, but also some disadvantage. So um, it's something that we do need to uh, see each individual and talk through the best option for each individual as and when you come. It's really important you understand that when the, the bypass anatomy means that nothing's really leaving your person. We're, we're, the surgeons are, are um, very sophisticated plumbers. They're rejigging what you've got inside um, so that the passage of food takes a new route and that bit of stomach you don't use anymore and the bit of bowel that you don't use anymore still has gastric juices flowing through it to join the bowel further down um, and it all has its own blood supply and it's still all there. You're just simply not using it for food. 
Hence, people believing that this is a reversible procedure. And technically it is, and as Mr. Grocox alluded to, that's not a simple procedure to do. On the NHS, an, a um, gastric bypass will never be reversed because desired weight loss has been achieved. A reversal of a um, gastric bypass on the NHS would be quite a serious matter because uh, there may be some complications and it's the best option for that patient for them to be safe. Uh, but it, it's just not ever routinely um, reversed on the NHS because weight loss has been achieved. Thank you. Um, so there's another question here which says, if you're kind of in surgery and you spot another serious problem, would you deal with it on the day? I suppose that's for you, Mr. Grocock. Um, I, I would say not. Uh, and the reason why we wouldn't is uh, because uh, you wouldn't be consented for it. So within surgical practice we would almost never do something uh, where we hadn't taken informed consent before an operation so if we found something that uh, wasn't life-threatening at time of surgery we would leave it in place uh, once you were awake and conscious we would talk through what we'd found do any further procedure to treat whatever had been found the only reason we would do something that we hadn't um, fully discussed before surgery is if it was a, a life-threatening thing at time of surgery. Uh, I would say, normally speaking, the only thing I can imagine there would be uh, bleeding. You know, we do sometimes, we use a vessel sealer. It's a machine that uh, both seals and divides all of the blood vessels as we operate. But perhaps, you know, within an operation, we might get... Uh, every fifth patient, you might make one cut with the vessel sealer. It doesn't quite seal things. And I need to try and seal things a second or a third time. So obviously, if you've got bleeding, we need to stop the bleeding any way we can. Uh, but it's very rare to convert procedures to open operations. Generally speaking, things are controllable laparoscopically. And that's that's part of our job, really, to both uh, avoid problems. And if we encounter a problem, to sort it out. And just to add into that, because obviously I, I see quite a few consent forms. Um, so again, do keep that open mind because sometimes on the day of consent, your surgeon might come to see you and say, right, we're consenting and, and they do go, they have to go through all the risks and benefits with you. Um, and they may say to you, so today we're going to be, we've listed you for a, a gastric bypass. If for any reason, when we were in there, we found that technically it was difficult. Perhaps you've had a surgery in there and there's a lot of adhesions. Previously, maybe you've had a, a, a say, for example, a, a cholecystectomy and there was um, quite a lot of scar tissue and it was decided that the best procedure to uh, go with would be a sleeve gastrectomy so sometimes you find that you'll be consented for more than one procedure with the primary objective being the one that you've come into but if that technically wasn't possible would you be happy for your surgeon to, to continue with a sleeve gastrectomy and that's why it's important when you get the uh, email pack from Salford when you come to meet our team there's some videos in there with lots of information about all the surgeries um, and there's booklets and there's a kind of checklist of everything we think you should know about surgery and a Q&A session and numbers for support so always keep that open mind be aware of all this the, the sleeve and the bypass the surgeries we offer um, it's very rare that on the day of surgery you don't get the surgery you're thinking you were going to have but it can happen so that's sometimes what you're consented for simply so that you know we don't have to wake you up to go actually we think a sleeve would have been better should we put you back to sleep and do it and <laughs> we, we wouldn't want to do that <laughs> Thanks, Jodie. Um, so there's questions about age. There's quite a few different ones. So um, if somebody's younger, are they likely to be prioritised for surgery? And if somebody's older, are they like to be, likely to be deprioritised for surgery? I think from a, a surgical point of view, it's only fair to say that there's absolutely no age cutoffs. It's all about the patient. Um, I, I very much think in terms of risk management, so as patients become older, they tend to have uh, more comorbidities. So the risk from surgery isn't the risk of the surgery in itself. It tends to be uh, the strain that we might put on the heart or put on the lungs uh, by doing a major procedure. So in bariatric surgery, if we had patients in the mid to late 70s, perhaps, then we ought to have a real careful think about whether surgery was in the best interest 
in terms of younger patients, uh, there's absolutely no difference. Essentially, you will be uh, assigned a clinical priority uh, when you come to the clinic uh, for people that require expedited surgery. For example, some people need to lose weight so that they can have a kidney transplant or they need to lose weight so they can have cancer treatment. We obviously prioritise those patients, uh, but in terms of age, uh, it, it makes no difference. Thank you. Um, this is quite a specific question here in some of these medical conditions, but I have a hole in my bladder and bowel. Would that be a problem for surgery? Sorry, can you just repeat the question for me, Stevie? Yeah, of course. Um, so somebody said, I have a hole in my bladder and bowel. Um, would that be a problem for surgery? Um, so the first thing that comes to mind sounds as if uh, that's what we call a colour of a cycle fistula. Uh, and it means that there'll be significant adhesions in the pelvis. Uh, if you were coming to see me in the clinic, it means that I would be more likely to offer you a sleeve rather than a bypass. The reason for that is a disease in the pelvis. The likelihood is that there will also be small bowel that's stuck to it. And that's going to make it difficult to bring the small bowel up. Uh, to the, the top of the abdomen to put onto the gastric pouch. So it wouldn't necessarily stop you having surgery, but it makes it more likely that the choice for you would be a sleeve. Thank you. Um, how long are you in hospital for after surgery? So ideally, you'll come in on the day of surgery and go home the following afternoon, evening. And there's a number of factors that might keep you in for an extra night. And um, we all have very different pain thresholds uh, when we do your surgery. Uh, we fill you up with a, a carbon dioxide gas that just makes things a little bit easier for our surgeons when they're trying to get their kit through. Um, and at the end of the surgery, where those little incisions are, the laparoscopic incisions, and they take out their kit, the air just literally goes out of the holes. No one's leaping on you trying to squish all the air out where it may have gone. So sometimes you can have little pockets left inside and that can be, be kind of painful a bit, like sometimes even as painful as a bit of a trap wind. Um, you can even feel that up in your shoulder tips or your um, collarbone. So managing pain after surgery is really important because it's a, uh, you'll be a little bit groggy when you first come round. We need you up and moving to get that gas to go off to avoid lots of complications to do with your chest and clots so mo moving after surgery is really really important and also for gut motility because straight away you're going to be weaning that newly formed little pouch or sleeve with tiny little sits um, nice and slow and steady so we can start getting things going the right way again and um, so you'll be in hospital uh, as I say hopefully overnight by the following afternoon, evening, once you've had a lovely NHS clear soup and perhaps a few teaspoons of clear jelly, if everything's staying down nicely and you're feeling OK, the best place to recover is at home because you can sleep better. You've got all your lovely prepared um, uh, liquid diet in the freezer ready to pop out in ice cube trays. You've, you'll be pottering around and, and just making everything a lot safer and nicer for your recovery. So we really try and avoid keeping you longer than we have to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so a question that I think is, is asked a lot on the Facebook support group. So um, somebody's asking, what is your opinion on having surgery abroad, even if the surgeons are regulated and you've researched the surgeon? Um, because a lot of uh, for a lot of us, three years is a long time and this may change due to the NHS struggles. Um, and as you know, prices in the UK are often um, extremely high compared to other places. Might both have an opinion sure. on that one. Yeah, yeah I, I don't mind saying what I think. I think if you're this close to NHS surgery, um, I would definitely wait for it. You know, even if you wait one, two, or even three years, it, it's hard at the minute. It's a big hot topic within bariatric surgery because uh, what we're not 100% sure about is actually how many people are going to Turkey and Egypt. Uh, what we do know is how many problems we sort out when people come back. So, you know, even if it was, say, three or five thousand pounds cheaper uh, to go to Turkey, you're talking about the, the cost of a, a second hand car. And uh, I would never put a second hand car uh, as a higher priority than your health. You know, I think um, very much from my point of view, I would uh, encourage you to have surgery within the UK. Uh, if you prepared to wait for treatment on the NHS, I would do that. 
Uh, and if you're not, you can, you can look for, for private options, but uh, we certainly sort out a lot of problems from abroad. And uh, it's in many ways quite wearing. Thank you, Jill. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think I think that's the hardest thing for our team right now. We we already knew that gynecological gynecological and bariatric surgeries were the worst hit by the pandemic, and the demand um, for bariatric surgeries increased throughout the pandemic. Um, but the resources, our broken NHS, our political system has made it really difficult for us to thrive as a service. Um, and now we have a new demand <clears throat> of bariatric tourism, and it's a bit of a strange phrase, um, simply because, of course, if anyone needs the NHS, they must come to us. And when people take that choice to go abroad to do sur to have bariatric surgery, um, they've researched it, they know what they're doing, they may well have been on programmes like this. Um, I, I wouldn't have a judgment or an opinion on that. Um, I think it's difficult because I do wonder how they manage to do it so cheap. <laughs> um, I think it's quite scary when I see our reps and what they charge us for the staple guns and the amazing equipment that we use to make things as safe as possible. So it, the figures never seem to quite add up, but that, that's that, that's not really get where I was kind of going. With. I guess the point of uh, our service and our NHS services is that they're not um, making additional space for hospitals or additional nurses or dietitians or surgeons or theatres so that we can look after the patients that have gone abroad and still be able to give the uh, see all our patients as well so whenever we have additional work it comes at a cost if we're removing bands and correcting sleeves we can't do our primary surgeries it's it's as simple as that so it it's very difficult for us to have a positive opinion on surgery abroad but i am also extremely understanding for why people look at it um, so it is, it's a very difficult uh, topic and situation. Um, and I guess the regulations we have, the surgeons I work with, um, I read all the referrals. I have so many letters every week. Please, this patient's just gone abroad. I don't know what to do with them. I've, not, I've only had this letter in a language I can't understand. Uh, please, can you follow up these patients? It's really, really difficult because we don't have that pathway. Uh, we can only see patients if they're in trouble. Um, so yeah, I, I, I absolutely sympathise because there's so many people wanting action now and I guess when I do these groups and I tell you about our waiting times because they are lengthy and the process is lengthy, I always say mentally, if you're prepared for the fact that you must live your life, you, you, you're, do, you're doing your best with your tier three rate management services, you're booking your holidays, you know that you're on a programme where you can be funded to have NHS surgery, then I guess you just have to bring those levels down and think well it's going to happen it's going to be longer than I want and I think that's really hard for people when they're living with other conditions that they want their weight loss to help with um, but that is the situation we're in at the moment. Thank you. Um, so um, some more questions about kind of life after surgery so first of all how long will somebody need to take off work and then second of all will they be able to engage in extreme sports like scuba diving and things like that? I always get a question I've never been asked before. I haven't, don't think I've ever been asked the scuba diving question. Have you, Mr. Grocock? Yeah, in terms of time off surgery, as a routine, you tend to give people a sick note for two weeks. And unless you've got a particularly physical job, uh, most people will be fit and ready to go back to, to work after a fortnight. We spoke briefly about pain after surgery before. I think... It, it's most sensible to expect some discomfort for a couple of days after surgery. Although it is almost always keyhole surgery, on the inside, it's really quite a big operation. And so I think if you come expecting some discomfort, then almost certainly things will be better than you expect. Whereas if you come in expecting no pain, then sometimes for day after surgery, people say it hurts more than they expected. So some of it is mental preparation. Uh, as a routine, we tend to give people sick note for two weeks. We tend to ask people to avoid heavy lifting uh, or very heavy physical work or exercise for up to six weeks. In terms of extreme sport, uh, there's no reason why you couldn't scuba dive after surgery. And, uh, you know, I, I think surgery really is, is about giving you, you quality of life back. So I would very much encourage you to but try and do everything you possibly can after surgery. I'd set no limits on yourself. 
Thank you. Um, there's two questions relating to um, intracranial hypertension. So um, one of them is, um, I have intracranial hypertension and it's causing issues with swelling in my eye and it's affecting my eyesight. I've been advised to have surgery, but I've been under weight management for years. Um, I'm concerned at the, le the length of the waiting list and whether my eyes are going to be affected. Can I yeah. take that one? Yep. Yeah, so just in the first instance for you as an individual, um, if, you're, if you're under a neurologist and they believe that weight loss would benefit and it's affecting your eyesight, then I'm sure our multidisciplinary team would want to hear about your case as an individual. Your weight management service can come and discuss your case with us in our MDT at any point. So you can request for that when it comes to what we could just call our expedited criteria. Now, intracranial hypertension is one that's on the cusp, but for where there isn't an a issue with eyesight, there's not been enough scientific evidence to say that bariatric surgery will do anything in terms of weight loss for intracranial hypertension. So it's not something we would actually put in our expedited criteria. Our expedited criteria is really, really small. As Mr. Grocock Pock said before, it's somebody who uh, needs a curative procedure, their BMI is too high. So we need to give them rapid weight loss so they can have a hysterectomy to get rid of a cancer, or perhaps they can't get on that transplant list and their kidneys are failing. So it's things like that that are very extreme where people get to have their surgery more quickly. Um, and um, but, but there are some cases Cases like this where eyesight's hint, being um, hindered where we would like to have more information from a neurologist so our team can look at that on an individual basis. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, does a previous pulmonary embolism stop you having surgery? Um, I'm on a Pixaban for life. Want to take that, Jodie? Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, so, most patients that come for surgery have got some sort of comorbidity, and uh, the team are used to, to managing all of those problems that patients come with. So, having had a PE in the past wouldn't stop you having surgery. Uh, in terms of the Apixivan, we'd normally stop it a couple of days before surgery. It allows time for your blood to thicken then we would do the operation. And then obviously we need to give you blood thinners afterwards. As soon as we're confident, we've got uh, hemostasis. So we know that there's no ongoing bleeding. Then we'll look to start thinning your blood out again. And uh, you would normally restart your apixaban uh, on day of discharge. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, there's lots of questions about um, mobility and people needing um, kind of hip replacements, knee replacements, that kind of thing. Um, and worries about people not being able to have um, operations on their, their hips or their knees until they've lost weight, but also being worried about not being able to lose enough weight to have surgery because of their poor mobility. So no specific question, I think just kind of your thoughts on, on that and which surgery should potentially come first. Um, I, I think <clears throat> one of the reasons why I'm a believer in bariatric surgery is that I think once you get to a certain size, it becomes incredibly difficult to uh, lose weight through diet and exercise. And one of the things that I like about bariatric surgery is it gets people back on the feet and it transforms your life. Uh, now, I think my feeling with it would be I would tend to wait for your bariatric surgery before joint replacement surgery. And the reason why I think that is that as your weight comes down, you may find that you don't need joint replacement surgery anymore because we would expect the, the pain from your joints to reduce as your weight comes down. Perfect, thank you. Um, how many surgeries do you do each week at the moment? So from my point of view, I have on average about a day and a half of operating per week. And one of the problems with Salford as a service is that a lot of that list space goes to cancer work. And so the, uh, the bariatric procedures are fitted around the cancer work. One of the other ways we're uh, making sure that we service the demand for bariatric surgery uh, is that up to 
uh, a BMI of between 50 and 55, we're doing as many patients as possible uh, within a local private hospital, just to give us increasing uh, access to theatre space. So in terms of a, a hard number, uh, it's difficult to give you a, a weekly number of operations that I do, uh, but roughly uh, about one and a half to two days of operating per week. And the number of cases you get through depends on the exact case mix. Uh, some operations take a full operating day uh, and other operations take 60 minutes. I'm trying to work out in my head how many have been done this week. So um, bariatric cases that I'm aware of this week, there's been there's been five and then there's been also some complex bariatric cases. So there might be the ones where there's a um, need of uh, revision. Maybe there's been, uh, I could try not to use the kind of bariatric tourist word, but anything where they come through the door and we might need to remove a gastric band or we might need to um, look at a, a, a surgical problem. Um, so I know that there's been five, five primary procedures just, and then there's been another list set aside for our complex procedures. So I think there'll be eight in total this week that I'm aware of. It varies week to week, as Mr. Grocock says. Um, you know, our surgeons are uh, all upper GI consultants um, and they specialize in cancer and bariatric surgeries. Um, so their demand for their skill is spread across two services already. Um, and that's why it's so important to us that we have places like the Oaklands Hospital, which is across the road from Salford, uh, where we can take our NHS patients and do our primary surgeries there as well so that our lists are ever moving because we know that's so, so important at the moment when the wait for those lists is so long. Thank you. Um, are there any circumstances um, in which you would decide against um, doing any surgery at all? Yeah, from, uh, from a surgical point of view, uh, we would encourage you or we may even decline to do any surgery uh, if we thought the risk to you were too great. So as we were saying before, it's really a balance of risks uh, between your quality of life and your health. If you were to have surgery versus continue as you were. And so as we see patients get into the mid to late 70s, or if we've got patients with multiple problems, for example, with the heart, with the lungs, with the kidneys, if we've got patients that have had multiple, multiple abdominal operations in the past, uh, then it may be that we would encourage you to uh, consider non-operative methods of weight management. For example, uh, some of the newer medications and sometimes a balloon. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's very much a, an individual thing. And it, that's why we still need to um, see people individually and choose a, a tailored uh, treatment for, on, based on each individual case. Thank you. Um, so this is probably a question that a lot of people are interested in. Once you get, once somebody gets the first call from Salford, um, what does the road to surgery look like from there? So um, our lovely waiting list coordinator will have the lovely job of being able to ring you and say, it's your turn. Are you available for clinic on, uh, it's always a Thursday afternoon and it's a clinic where you come and you have your bloods taken, your observations done. Um, you meet our medics and our surgeons. Sometimes you don't always need to meet our medics. It depends on your comorbidities. It depends on your history. Um, and um, on meeting your surgeon, you'll hopefully have an idea of which surgery would suit you best. At that point, we have a provisional idea of what we would, what we call lists. So the waiting, what, what your primary surgery would be so that you can go onto the waiting list once a few other things are done. So when you're met on an individual basis, there may be other health concerns that we would want to know a little bit more about. So your surgeon may write to a few of your specialists, get an overall opinion before proceeding. Um, we might like you to do a sleep study so this is where you might have a condition called obstructive sleep apnea, which is basically when you go to sleep at night and for whatever reason, 
uh, you fail to take a breath and your brain says, you're not breathing, wake up. You may never fully wake up. You might be a bit of a snorer. You might do a bit of a gasp and have a bit of a jolt, or you may never know that you have this condition, but you wake up in the morning and you're very, very tired because you're never getting that beautiful deep sleep you need. Um, so that kind of condition is really useful to know you have. Um, and it's something that can be treated as well. So you're, so we tend to refer people, we think we may uh, have obstructive sleep apnea or, or we'd like to rule that out. Um, you don't necessarily have to have the treatment for it, but it's very useful for our anaesthetists to know that this is a condition you have when they're looking after you during surgery and sometimes where you need to be looked after after surgery. And if you already have obstructive sleep apnea, um, then do bring in your CPAP machines with you when you come to hospital, because that's um, definitely something you're going to need overnight. Um, so we'll look for for that through our sleep service and you may have already had the test done for your GP so bring that information with you to clinic and the other thing is psychology which is so so important um because sometimes when when this, when before somebody else said is there ever a reason that you might not have surgery um bariatric surgery obesity life it's all body and mind for all of us isn't it really um you need you need that understanding you need that education you need to be, be so self-aware uh, the people that are the most self-aware do well with this surgery if they know that their, their downfalls if they know the things that they may need a bit of a mental toolkit for for the rest of their days if they've always leaned on food in a crisis what are they going to lean on after surgery so these are the kind of basic things around uh, a readiness for surgery assessment but then there could be much deeper things as well that hopefully you've explored and addressed in your weight management service um, and that's a big part of your weight management so even if you think oh no I'm fine join any of those groups take advantage of any psychology you have on offer it's it's such a finite resource and they're part of our tier three weight management services and um, so absolutely take advantage of anything psychologically you can join in at this time and um, just have that readiness for surgery um, so we'll do that psychological uh, assessment as well. And then your, sec your surgeon secretary will guide you down the road to um, your surgery. It's really hard for me to ever to be able to say, oh, yeah, you'll meet your surgeon and then you'll have your surgery in six months time. It doesn't work like that. It really doesn't, I'm afraid, because some people would be suitable for the Oaklands Hospital. And unfortunately, not everybody is. There's reasons that you do need to have your surgery at Salford sometimes. And those late waits may be longer. Um, so you'll have a better idea once you've kind of been put on the waiting list after all those things are done and then um, keep that communication with your surgeon secretary so you know what's happening and keep coming to these groups so you don't feel lost and still supported. Thanks Jodie. Um, so a question about IVF, does weight loss surgery have any effects on IVF treatments which I'll need once my BMI reaches 35? Do you want me to take that one? Yeah, you can. Yeah, so um, IVF, uh, if somebody, um, a lady or a gentleman, are going through fertility treatment and they are under a fertility clinic and having tests for their fertility, all the numerous things that people go through for it, on the NHS there is a cut-off age and BMI. We um, offer support for people that are under... Uh, wait uh, under a fertility clinic that have done everything they should have done but now they're at that point where they're being told you can't go onto the list for IVF because your BMI is too high um, and as a service we support people's right to be able to um, try for a child and um, so that is uh, something uh, uh, that we would help with as well in terms of weight loss and um, for IVF treatment. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get past all of the waiting list questions. Um, so I don't know if you want to pick that one up now, Jodie, or at the end. I, I, to be honest, I think I've covered it. It's at the moment from referral to coming to meet our team, our service managers, all our surgeons, me, everyone, we're trying to exhaust every opportunity we have to see more people. Um, and um, at the moment it's over a year and we're trying to bring it down to the year point. I know that we've cut it down by 10 weeks already, but it's bad, it's over a year. We need it under a year. So we are working on that as a team. Thank you. Um, so somebody, I know it's not as simple as this question, but somebody's asked, what weight do you have to be to be accepted for surgery? Which one of you would like to take that? 
So uh, there's no absolute cutoff. Uh, like we were saying before, it's about risk management. So to have your surgery done at the Oaklands, uh, which means it'll be done more quickly uh, than normally speaking, the cutoffs are 50, BMI 55 for females and 50 for males. It's not a, an absolute uh, fixed cutoff. There is some flexibility, but essentially we need to believe that surgery would be safe at the Oaklands for it to be done on that side. Once we get BMIs into the high 50s and 60s, uh, then you're obviously still considered for surgery, but that's perhaps when we'd move more towards uh, a sleeve and sometimes either medication or a balloon first so that we can bring your weight down slightly before a, a definitive bariatric procedure. And that's not about um, trying to manage resources, it's about trying to do what's the safest for you so that you get a, a good long-term effective result. Thank you. Um, probably um, a topic that's quite hot on everyone's lips at the moment. Um, are there NHS strikes having an impact on the waiting list? Um, well, I'm the only one on the service <laughs> in terms of coming to see you the next day. Um, and I, I would no. I, th I think the short answer is no. Um, as, the, yeah. as, the, as you've seen, nurses and, and striking across the NHS is was I think most of the strikes I've not been allowed to do because our centre was told that we can't and as an NHS we already are running on the lowest staffing threshold so there's very few of us that can be then spared to go and strike but they are trying to accommodate that for us so that we can that we have our rights to do that but in an NHS setting um it's really not like just walking out and leaving everybody you can't and um, so no services won't be affected by uh, by the strikes. Thanks, Jodie. Yeah, it, it doesn't make uh, any difference at all. My understanding is at, at Salford, nobody's actually on strike. Uh, and the reason why they're not is because, uh, the, as I understand it, the way the legal rules are these days, you need to have a turnout in excess of 50% for a, a strike vote to be valid. So as far as I'm aware, there isn't anybody on strike inside Salford the major constraint we've got from an NHS point of view is avail availability of beds and availability of theatre space. There is pressure on beds, particularly in January and February. Uh, that's happened every single year. It's an ongoing problem this year in terms of theatre space. I think we've already covered it. Uh, a lot of the theatre space in Salford goes to high-risk cancer work, uh, and that leaves relatively little theatre space for uh, people that need bariatric procedures who've got too many comorbidities or the BMI is too high for the surgery to be done at the Oaklands. So that subgroup of patients uh, do still have a significant weight. Thank you. Um, I probably can't say this word correctly, but it'll give me a, give me a chance. Um, so I was just wondering if these surgeries have any effects on immunological responses. Do you want to take that, Jodie, or shall I? I'm happy to. No, I'll let, I'll let you. I think there is a lot about bariatric surgery that's not 100% uh, understood. For example, we're not 100% sure why it seems to be so effective at reversing uh, diabetes. Uh, in terms of immunology, uh, I would say that loss of weight uh, will improve your immunological function uh, we spoke before about malabsorptive procedures, so bypasses, uh, in theory at least, uh, I would say that having a bypass, because you're not absorbing things in the normal way, uh, it may affect your immune system more than, for example, a sleeve would. And that's why it's so important that you understand the reasons you're asked to do um, supplements for lifelong, um, because that, that actually can be quite a big deal. Um, nurses always say how terrible they are at remembering to take their course of antibiotics or all these kind of things. So, you know, joking aside, it, it, there's a reason that we're asking you to do uh, the supplement regime, and that's to keep you safe and not to have deficiencies long term. Thank you. I'm not sure if this was covered um, in the um, presentation, but I think somebody's missed it. Um, how long does each procedure take? Um, from a, a surgical point of view, uh, it depends on each individual patient. Again, 
Now, generally speaking, a sleeve is a faster operation than a bypass. Uh, and the reasons for that is it's surgically much more straightforward. And it's because we're operating in one part of the body. There's very little um, laparoscopic stitching required. So laparoscopic stitching is relatively time consuming. And so we could uh, think of being able to do a, a sleeve in perhaps an hour, whereas a bypass might take 90 or even two hours, depending on the size of the patient. Again, size of the patient uh, has a significant impact on the operating time, particularly for, for bypasses. Thank you. Um, hmm. Is there a minimum BMI to be eligible for surgery? That's a really good question. We get that quite a bit. So when you join your tier three weight management service, it's because you've met criteria for your GP to be allowed to, to refer you. So that's usually a BMI of 35 with a comorbidity or a BMI of 40. I know some areas vary, which can be a bit cruel, but that's the nice guidance. Um, and during your time with weight management, if you started with a BMI of 35 and you went to a BMI of 32, you have type 2 diabetes and some other concerns and you come and meet our team, we may say to you, well, we have done really well, um, but we definitely wouldn't turn you away. Um, so, so no, uh, ethically, we would question anybody who's, you know, we wouldn't do anybody who is in a healthy BMI. Uh, but yeah, if you still have a BMI above 30 and you've done well in your weight management and you've got reasons that you wish to pursue with bariatric surgery, as long as those discussions are, are, are had and everybody's happy. And we always um, talk about every patient in a multidisciplinary team meeting um, with your input from those uh, clinics. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so, and, and nothing's ever fixed in stone either. So when you come and meet us in clinic, it doesn't mean you're then tied to having to have a surgery at a certain point. At any point, you can revisit things with your team because um, we, you know, we meet you that that one time, um, and then you're um, have some education and support with me and Chris. Uh, but we do rely on you then contacting us if you have any uh, health changes, um, if you have any concerns with weight. That can be difficult sometimes with fluctuating weight. We get a lot of people saying, "I was referred over a year ago." I'm pretty sure I'm not the referral weight I was. <laughs> I think I put weight back on and I'm scared that I'm going to come and see you and you're going to tell me uh, that, you know, you can't see me now. That never happens. We'll see everybody. And um, they have, there can be an impact sometimes if there's a great amount of weight that's been put on. But if it's just the fluctuations that we would expect with obesity, where we get those ups and downs, and pe um, then that's, that's, and please, please don't worry. You're coming to see a team that completely understand obesity. So uh, you won't be penalised or turned away. Thanks, Jodie. Um, why is it that you can't smoke in order to get surgery? One of the reasons we actively discourage people smoking uh, is that it ups the, the risk and the complication of surgery. Uh, so <clears throat> what smoking does is it both uh, damages your, your lungs and it makes it much, much more likely post-operatively that you'll get a chest infection. Uh, but more significantly from a surgical point of view is it damages the, the small vessels uh, within the stomach wall uh, and we see higher rates of leakage. And that's one or the main reason why we would you know, very much discourage you uh, from smoking in the run-up to surgery. It's all about having one operation that goes well and avoiding uh, a major complication because... Uh, from a patient's point of view, the major complications uh, might be such that longer term, you wish you'd carried on as you were. Mm -hmm. So it's very much about getting it right first time, avoiding a significant complication, having a, a safe operation and getting the benefit from it. Yeah, so it's so important you understand to stop smoking before surgery. Um, and we always make it sound like we're kind of the health police. So you're going to lose weight and be super healthy if you're a non-smoker and she really shouldn't have alcohol after bariatric surgery either. So it feels like very clean living. But there's so many amazing reasons why. And, and you do get a lot of changes after surgery. The hardest thing to do, I think, for bariatric surgery, if you are a smoker, is stop smoking. Um, because it's so so addictive so if there's one thing you can do in preparation it would be to try and find a way to stop smoking uh, we have had patients who come um, and, and unfortunately had to have their surgery cancelled because they're smokers and it's not because we're really cruel it's because no surgeon wants to do a surgery where they know that that could break down 
um, because of an ulcer at the surgical joint they make inside and it's incredibly dangerous um, and unfortunately me and Chris do see a lot of complications of people that are smokers they just couldn't stop smoking and they get ulcers and then maybe ulcers over that and they end up malnourished and in some cases even having to be tube fed it's a really serious issue um, for, for us as a team if we're trying to deal with complications especially with ulcers if people can't stop smoking whatever we could try and do um, if there was a surgical intervention we can't do because people are still smoking so it's that addictive um, so it's really something that anybody is a smoker who's on this program to address we get lots of questions about vapes and e-cigarettes um, it's difficult we know that it's definitely better than smoking we don't know the exact mechanism of why smoking will, will cause the problems that we get. Is it the nicotine in the bloodstream? So we ask you to be a 0% vape smoker and we ask you to stop vaping six weeks before surgery. And then ideally, not again, but you definitely need to be on a 0% vape um, if you can't get off the kind of the habitual side of it completely. Thank you. Um, so there's another question about the private hospitals that are being utilised. So you mentioned that some people can be seen at the Oaklands. Is that the only private hospital that's being used or are there others in use around across the north? Yeah, it is. It, it, it is. Um, currently, we just use the Oaklands Hospital and it's a lovely little hospital. It's right opposite the, the um our primary site and um, we've been doing surgeries there for over a year now and it's become a center for private um bariatric surgeries as well so they're, they're, they're well versed in what they do and um, i believe they have a really nice anaesthetist because i think all my patients when i phone them they all say how nice the anaesthetist is and um, so i always feed that back but no and, and i think it's quite a calm place to be as well because it is a private surgery so it's a private hospital so it's a bit quieter than our busy center so it's a quite nice um place to recover after your surgery as well we can't use it for everyone and that can seem a little bit harsh but um i would stress that actually our nhs center is excellent um in the sense that if you have got uh, higher risks and you're signing your consent knowing that perhaps um you've got uh, heart disease or um renal disease or other issues that can make your surgery a bit riskier you absolutely want the expertise of all our other teams and our hdu which is the high dependency unit or our intensive care unit or our monitored bed area where you have a higher ratio show of skilled nurses and um, so there's very good reasons to have your surgery at Salford and that's something that you would discuss um, and you do have an element of choice in that if you don't want to have your surgery at a private facility you can absolutely stay on, a, on the list for Salford as well but it's just nice that we have these places for people that um, have less uh, comorbidities with slightly low BMIs because these are the criteria that they set for sound reasons and um, so that it, people that are having their surgeries done over there means there's less people waiting for surgeries at Salford so it benefits the waiting list across the board um, I guess again if I'm getting a bit political uh, when uh, places like the Spire and the Alexandra Hospital uh, gave over their facilities for uh, uh, the NHS to use during Covid a lot of the contracts we used to have with those centres to use for bariatric surgery they didn't want any more because one of the things that came out of COVID um, in this quite mishmash of our society now is that a lot of people are wanting to go private for things. Um, so they, they don't need our, our NHS money in the same way. So a lot of places we actually lost contracts with because they had so much of their own private work to do, they didn't need the extra work. Um, so again, that's a sad reality of the fact that we are ever busier in our healthcare industry, both privately and through the NHS. Thanks, Jodie. Um, so there's been a few questions about sex ender. Um, so one being, um, if I'm on, if I'm taking sex ender, am I still eligible for surgery? And the other one being, um, whilst I'm waiting for surgery, can my GP not just prescribe me sex ender? So uh, I can start off in terms of would sex ender stop you having surgery? It wouldn't. Uh, in terms of the second question, I might pass that one to Jody. The, the rules, one of the problems with bariatric surgery uh, is that it varies across the country. Uh, in terms of exact rules for sex ender, Jody, do you want to yeah, take that so, question? So this, I mean, to be honest, it's our weight management services that would know more. Perhaps Stevie would be even better answering this. But in terms of when we talk about weight loss services, 
Um, your weight management service is what we call a, a funded tier three service and a funded tier three service are the only service that can refer to a funded tier four bariatric surgical service. So when you're talking about just our tier four service, so when you meet the surgeons and maybe you've got a very high BMI and we might say, well, we could look at a balloon, but we're, we can actually use Saxenda now to try and bring your weight down so that you could have a bypass or sleep more safely for those, again, very high BMIs that we might see. Whereas as a primary medical weight management treatment, the commissioners are trying to set out pathways which are not being finalised and they've even envisaged that they may not get finalised till the end of the year. But I believe in weight management, every service has got some quite strict criteria where they are beginning to be able to offer this. So we know already that used correctly, Saxenda can be a wonderful weight loss tool. It's not a fad like all of us um, are in the world of obesity. We get silly ads about, you know, have this pill and it just melts while you're sleeping. This is this is the real deal. Saxenda can really help people. It doesn't work for everyone, unfortunately, um, but with the right uh, understanding of how to use it, your calorie capping, the fact that you, it does help with your appetite, you just don't feel as hungry, which is nice. Um, yeah, so so I'll, I'll kind of skip over to, to Stevie now to see kind of where that tier three service is at in that being allowed to offer it. Yeah, so I, um, I think Sabah can speak for more life and a few more areas than I can, but I can speak on behalf of Oldham and our commissioners there. So the criteria is very strict and it's the same across the board. So you must be pre-diabetic and that means your HbA1c level should fall within a certain area. And if it doesn't, then you're not eligible. But you should also, you also need to have a cardiovascular risk. So something like high blood pressure as well, which is being medicated. Um, so that's a very, very strict criteria. Lots of people are being referred to our services just for Saxenda. Um, however, we are having to manage a lot of expectations there and there's a lot of people that aren't necessarily um, eligible. And, and that's not been, those expectations haven't been set at the GP or at any appointments leading up to them coming to us. So that obviously leads to a lot of dissatisfaction. Um, and I think across Oldham, in one year, we can only um, prescribe 96 clients with um, sex ender. And Sabra, I don't know if you've got a little bit more um, from more life's point of view. It's very similar to what you're saying, Stevie. Nice guidelines are very strict. So your HbA1c needs to be between 42 and 47, and it rules out a lot of patients. Um, going forward, there might be developments. There's a medication called Wega V coming up or WEGAV, so that may make a difference with their criteria being slightly less rigid. Um, so yeah, just watch this space. Yeah, um, okay. Um, are there any plans for a dedicated bariatric center like there are for heart conditions and cancers? This is what we need. You must lobby your GPs, you must lobby your counselors, right to everybody, right to commissioners. This is exactly what we need. We need bariatric services to not be competing with any other service. We need to be standalone. We need to have a dead, need to be able to offer what we're all very passionate about in Salford. Um, so that is that is definitely the dream. Um, and, and I really wish that is something that uh, will come about. I don't think it's false to expect something like this to happen because um, obesity is the pandemic that's been ignored, but I feel that we are in a bit of a crisis point across the board, so it's really difficult. So that's why it's very important that we keep the, the uh, challenging the status quo. And, and, and I think there was a comment before, wasn't it? Like that horrible catch 22 that you can find yourself in. You need new hips, you need, need new knees. When you're in pain, you're fatigued and it's much harder to add in exercise. Um, so in answer to that, if you're um, within a weight management service where you've been really quite dedicated, the team that you're with are, are, are impressed with you, but your weight loss tends to be a little bit static or maybe it's just not an, uh, enough of a drop talk to your key worker talk to them to say what is it that you think I could do where an MDT panel would consider referring me on you know we have guidelines they're quite rigid um but I think this is something you need to explore with your tier three services so if you're in a place where you've been dedicated you've made lifestyle changes you've addressed um portion size you've stopped smoking you've done all these things to prepare yourself for that meaningful weight loss surgery 
Um, and these, are the, and but your five percent is just not quite there, um, and and it's difficult because it's hindered by your um, immobility. Then please, please reach out to your to tier three services and talk more about that. And they may say to you, well, actually this and this, let's look at that, and then I'll take you to our panel and we'll see what see whether there's um, any uh, reasonable grace that can be given. Thanks, Jodie. Um, there's quite a few questions um, where I think we must have a lot of new people on the session tonight. People seem quite confused about the pathways and kind of what they mean. People asking if they're seeing a nutritionist, what happens next, where, where are they in the process? So I don't know that it might be worth me just running through the kind of referral process, tier three, tier four, if you think that would be helpful. Yeah, that's great. And, we, and I think the point of these sessions is keep coming because yeah. every time we do a different topic. So the tier three services are gonna do a topic just on that, making the most of your tier three. What is this all about? Um, obviously when you're at the very beginning of you, you may have just gone to one session so far, perhaps with your weight management and the next time you go, everything will become a little bit more clearer. And um, so no, don't, you know, whenever you feel confused, do obviously do ask, but yeah, that's a great idea, Stevie, but we might let Mr. Grocock go because I'm sure he may be in theater tomorrow and we may be making him busy again. Um, so thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank, thank you very much, Jody. Um, good night. And I'm sure I'll see you in a few months time. Thank you. See you soon. Bye bye. Um, so if I briefly just go through kind of the, the referral process and kind of how you've come to the point right now and what might happen next. Saba, feel free to jump in at any point if I miss anything out. But essentially, most of you will have come um, to, to this point by being referred from a GP or a healthcare practitioner or some, some other healthcare professional in the community into a weight management service. Um, if you're eligible for bariatric surgery in your area, then you will have been put on a bariatric pathway. Essentially, what you need to do is you need to do 12 months of lifestyle support within that tier three service. So anyone, anybody that's with More Life or ABL Health, that's a tier three service. Um, so that's just weight management in your community, basically. Um, you'll do this 12 months of um, lifestyle intervention where you'll look at your eating habits, you'll look at um, your physical activity levels, you'll look at your behaviours, your health behaviours in general, um, and you'll try to make improvements, which hopefully in turn will lead to weight loss. Now, in most areas, you are required to lose 5% of your body weight from the first appointment with your weight management service before you can be referred for bariatric surgery. There's a whole host of other criteria, um, which I won't get into now. We'll talk about that more um, in, in the next session. Um, but you'll then be discussed at the end of your 12-month intervention at an MDT meeting where um, a dietitian, a doctor, um, a bariatric lead, potentially a nutritionist and um, lots of different healthcare professionals will sit around the table, discuss your case and then see if you are ready or suitable to be referred for surgery. And um, if you are at that point, what happens is your weight management service will gather all of your medical information and all of your kind of history of the intervention you've had with them. Fill in a referral form with any supporting documents and send it to your tier four provider. So that's basically where the bariatric surgery happens. So that might be Salford Royal, if you live in the Northwest or in Wales, and um, Castle Hill, if you live in North or Northeast Lincolnshire. Um, so we send the referrals off. And then once you um, that referral is um, sent, at ABL Health, we will support you until you are seen by your um, by the surgery provider. We'll still offer you monthly webinars as these, We'll offer you additional monthly webinars, physical activity sessions, and there's a monthly moving forward session that you can attend. So basically, you're not being left on your own. You've still got that support, but you need to engage and take as much advantage of that as possible. Um, and I think at More Life, they have a bariatric moving forward group. Sabra, is that right? Yes, yeah, there's some support afterwards. So we want to leave you um, just waiting. And we'd encourage you to stay on this group as well yeah. and keep on watching. Absolutely. So we don't know essentially how long it will take for your your surgery site to contact you after we've sent that referral. And actually, we're quite blind as the referrer as to where you are on a waiting list. So 
contacting us to ask where you are is really ineffective because we've not got the answers. We can't contact Jodie and ask her. That's not her job. You know, she should be there actually looking after patients and giving information and informing them of what, what's happening and doing that follow up care. So there's just not a way for us at the minute to find out where you are on that list. Um, but we need to trust in the process that when it's time, you'll be then contacted by the tier four provider. And I think Jodie's gone through the rest of the process um, kind of earlier in the day. But that's essentially um, what the support looks like from the day that you start your weight management service until you are referred to Salford Royal. And I hope that has answered um, some of your questions. Um, Jodie, anything you want to add there? No, no, I think that's absolutely right. It's hard. It's um, frustrating when you're thinking oh well, you know when are they going to see me and so on um, and like I say on here I can give you that update that we're trying to bring it down to the 12 month mark and we're not there yet so it's kind of from when you're referred you roughly think right okay so this time next year I'm going to be trying to get hold of Salford and say uh, you know where's where's things up to and I think that I think that is reasonable to be fair but it's difficult um, because the service is going through a lot of change and we do want to have dedicated people that can help with this but when we get inundated with calls um you know it's really difficult because we understand why people are ringing uh but we may not have anything new to tell you so this is probably the best place because at, at one point we were at, from referral to meeting the team it was 76 weeks um and that's what we've been carving into so all the people from one year to 76 weeks are the people that we're seeing right now um so yeah it, it, it it's difficult it's really really tough because um through the updates i think if you kind of go through all our recordings it mean like oh we're at nine months oh yeah it's about 11 months um so i do try and give people time scales here of that referral information um and then after surgery it is very much led by your surgeon secretary perfect um so i think i'll ask one more question jody and then we'll leave it there um, just before we ask that question, just in the chat box, I've posted um, a satisfaction survey. So that just helps us to direct the sessions going forward. So if you wouldn't mind filling that in, that'd be really helpful. And I've also posted the link to the um, Facebook support group if you do want to join that. Um, Abby, would you mind just posting a link to the YouTube channel with all the previous recordings on for anybody that's new for us tonight as well, please? And then the final question is... Um, Somebody has been advised that they're unlikely to be accepted for surgery because they drink at the weekends. Is that true? And Jodie, what impact does drinking alcohol have on you um, after you've had surgery? Um, so, so, no, I, I guess the point is when you come to meet our team, as long as you know you haven't got alcoholic dependency, and again, that can be a bit of a funny thing. So um, in life, you might think, well, I'll come home and to celebrate the fact I'm home and I've had a long day I'm gonna to have to have a glass of wine well I've opened it now so I may as well have another glass of wine and so on and so on so there is a difference between um what some of us would appear to think as an alcoholic as somebody who's just drunk all the time and can't function actually a lot of people are high functioning alcoholics um so it's just having an understanding of your alcohol consumption and that's something that definitely happens during your tier three weight management and um, so if you're somebody that enjoys a drink now and then social drinking on the weekend or the, uh, whatever you enjoy here and there that's that's completely acceptable after surgery you might find that very difficult now we ask you to abstain for six months um, your system's new it, it's it's brand new so things you thought you liked before you might not like and um, you're weaning it like a baby and you wouldn't give your baby uh, a, a, well some used to give babies whiskey but you wouldn't give you wouldn't give your baby a glass of wine would you so you have to kind of go very gentle alcohol is a poison um so essentially when you have it it's one it's empty carbs so you're cheating your surgery because your body is going to use the carbs it gets uh, the, the conversion of that uh, sugar into carbohydrate um as fuel rather than your excess fat um when you first have a drink um it's sweet so you might get dumping syndrome and feel incredibly ill um if you do tolerate some alcohol you might enjoy it but that one drink is absolutely enough because you really feel the effect you're a virgin drinker again um uh, I was chatting at the patient I assessed this afternoon. He says all his friends absolutely love him. He doesn't miss drinking one bit, and he's always the designated driver. 
um, and he, he's really surprised by the fact that it hasn't impacted in things that he always associated with you do this and you have beer or you do this and you have that um, so sometimes it's just challenging that status quo and even though we see um, and we're still seen as a culture of binge drinkers um, it's not really necessarily true um, so it doesn't mean you'll never enjoy a drink again but I, one thing I would warn um, uh, what's the word um, because of things like dumping syndrome and because you can feel unwell with alcohol lots of people think oh well I'm going to a wedding or it's my daughter's wedding I'll probably have a drink then but then you've ruined your evening because you get dumping syndrome and you just feel really ill for two or three hours and um, so just if you're thinking of trying something always try it with people you trust and at home so then you know that oh actually I, I'm all right having that and fizzy drinks are a huge no-no you can't have fizzy drinks after bariatric surgery it makes you inc incredibly uncomfortable um, and if you pers persist with it it's something that could potentially stretch out the air the area as well um, and alcohol is often comes in a fizzy way so um, it can be difficult to find the right thing to have as well so very often people are like you know what? I don't even miss it and, and I'm not really got an interest in it anymore so it, it's interesting uh, the things that change with bariatric surgery that perhaps you thought you would definitely miss this and, and you don't so Perfect. Thanks, Jodie. Um, so we'll leave it there. I think we've managed to get through quite a lot of questions there. And um, there are still some unanswered, and I'm sorry that we can't get through them all. Um, I try to pick out questions that haven't been asked before and kind of ones that are really common that I, I feel like you need to know every time. Um, but keep doing your own research. Abby has posted um, the link to the YouTube channel where you can see all of the healthcare professionals delivering their talk. So that's a full talk from Jodie and um, Chris, the dietitian. We've got a pharmacist. We've got many of the different surgeons speaking. For anybody that's going to be going to Castle Hill, there's a collaborative um, session as well that you can go and look through. Um, and that's just going to give you a lot of information. So if you feel like you've not got everything you need today, definitely go away and do your own research. Um, but otherwise, we'll see you in a month on the first Wednesday of the month as usual, which will be the 1st of March. Yeah, it's the 1st of March. It's going to be our patient experience night. And then the month after the ever popular Mr. Al Kafaf is back. Yeah, <laughs> he is very popular, isn't he? Um, OK, well, Jodie, thank you very much for all your knowledge. Um, and I'm sure everyone appreciates everything that you've done. Um, and we'll see you next month. See you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.